Hello, everyone, and welcome to this cell live stream debate. My name is Bruno Libaber. I'm the Director General of the Center on Regulation in Europe, CER, the independent think tank focusing on the regulation of energy mobility and the sectors we will deal with today, tech and media. No matter where you, you're watching us from, the COVID-19 pandemic has most certainly impacted your life. But could it also be a game changer for relationship and that of public authorities with online platforms? Before this outbreak, platforms had already significantly changed the ways we work, we interact, we buy, we learn. They had also been and still are subject to, to a lot of attention on behalf of, of regulators, of policymakers from all over the world. And they are concerned about a number of big tech's practices and behaviors which impact competition, users and consumers' choice, experience and privacy, and sometimes even the democratic process. Now, with the COVID-19 situation, an even more crude light is cast on the role of platforms and the issues around them in today's world. The crisis is highlighting the benefits, the opportunities and the risks generated by the online platform economy, and those are bigger than ever. And in my view, it is also forcing us to, to wonder whether to fully enjoy the benefits and opportunities and mitigate the risks, some form of enhanced cooperation between platforms and governments based on clear and enforceable principles and rules should now be assertively considered. That is why this debate asks the question of whether we are heading towards the post-COVID-19 digital deal between tech and governments with a big question mark. And to address the, the topic in a meaningful way, we have gathered two global players. Thank you wholeheartedly to, to both of them for their swift, positive response to sales invitation. Thierry Breton, the European Commissioner for the Internal Market, is playing a key role in the development of the Commission's forthcoming proposals for new rules for the digital age. So good evening, Commissioner, and very great to have you with us. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, all. I'm, I'm also delighted to welcome Mark Zuckerberg, the, the founder, chairman, and CEO of Facebook, who's joining us from California. So therefore, good morning, Mark Zuckerberg. Thanks, Bruno. It's, um, I'm glad to be joining. Thank you for having me. So before we start our conversation, I'd like to remind viewers that they have the, the possibility to ask questions via Slido with the code slash digital. And I've no doubt that they will make good use of the, of the facility. So let's begin with, with the role of platforms and, and the collaboration between them and governments during the, the COVID-19 crisis. Mark Zuckerberg, what's, what is your experience so far? What has been your experience so far? And what are your views on that? Well, I mean, this is a, an emergency on a lot of different fronts. Um, it's a health emergency. It's an economic emergency. Um, it's a security emergency around things like misinformation. Um, and it's also a social crisis where people need to stay connected more than ever. And you know, I think, frankly, everyone is trying to figure this out at once. And that does require a greater degree of, of partnership um, between governments and, and the private sector to adapt quickly. Um, and you know, part of what I've appreciated uh, in, in, in terms of the engagement that, that we've been able to have um, with the commissioner here, uh, but also other, others around the world, is that during this time, you know, it's not just about you know, what regulations are on the books. Um, you know, the, the commissioner here, for example, is, is very, um, has been very proactive about reaching out when there are things that we can be doing to be helpful proactively as well. So let me, let me give you a few examples. Um, you know, for, for one, um, you know, one of the things that we're very focused on is fighting misinformation. And we work very hard uh, to make sure that we have good collaboration um, with the intelligence community and, and governments around the world uh, to make sure that we can find um, any kind of coordinated information campaigns um, coming from any governments. And um, we've had a good collaboration here, um, both formally and, and informally, um, to share data on what we're seeing from, um, from, from different countries, give, give tips on um, where we think risks might be coming. Um, and in general, 
uh, we've been able to really step up the efforts to fight misinformation. Um, we've taken down hundreds of thousands of pieces of harmful misinformation, um, and our independent fact-checking program has uh, yielded more than 50 million warnings being shown on, on pieces of content uh, that might be uh, that, 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 are, that are false related to COVID, which we know that that works because 95% of the time uh, when someone sees a piece of content with a label on it, they don't end up clicking through. So this is a, a really good collaboration. Um, if, if we have a moment, let me give another example, um, which is that right now more than ever, uh, people really need to stay connected to the people that they love and care about. Um, you know, we've seen in a lot of countries, for example, in Italy, um, usage of our services went up by more than 70 percent. Um, you know, usage of group video calling um, went up by 10x, so, you know, a thousand percent. Uh, but one of the things that's been very important is making sure that the video networks, or sorry, the internet networks um, stay running. So, you know, the, the commissioner, you know, and his team gave us a, a call uh, because he, he he was getting feedback from from uh, the the internet operators ac across Europe um, that there might be an issue, and you know very quickly we were able to work together to um, to reduce the bandwidth that that our services consumed uh, to not uh, use HD video by default during this period, um, and to make sure that the networks could stay healthy so people could stay connected. And I think that those are just two examples of of the type of collaboration that. Uh, I, I think, frankly, has been very productive and, and helpful um, and that, that I appreciate as, as someone trying to you know, do our best to help out during this period in the private sector. I think we need that kind of partnership. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Breton, from, from, the, ver from the, the very beginning of the lockdown, you have been personally in touch with a number of platform CEOs. What, what do you draw from those contacts? You know, we just, you know, it looks so, so weird. We are here talking of the crisis like if it was over. And like if we were here to draw lessons, we are still in this crisis. But it's true that I think it's good to, um, to stop for a while and to, um, to think about what we learned so far. I say so far because it is not the end of the game, of course. Um, when it happens, when it happens, uh, let's come back to, uh, uh, back to, uh, to the beginning of March. Um, we had at the time um, uh, a peak in Italy, uh, to tell you the truth, a lot of countries were still thinking that it will be contained in Italy, but then of course it moved fast. And, um, and to tell you the truth also, I have the feeling, after all the contacts I had, that some countries, let's be frank, including in the US, were thinking, were still thinking at the time that they will be protected. When I say country, means also maybe government. And uh, when uh, I saw this, um, I thought that it was extremely important to anticipate. So the first key word is anticipation is such an unbelievable situation. Anticipation means for me, as a commissioner in charge of the market and, 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 and digital, was to say, hey, if we are obliged to be confined altogether here in Europe, we were still thinking only in Europe at that time. What will happen? We'll have maybe one, one half, one third, two thirds of the population staying at home. And then I said to myself, because you know, um, in my past, uh, I, 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 had, I had a previous life before being a commissioner, as you probably know, and, uh, and, and a little bit of telecommunication. And I said, you know, the, the, the telecom networks that we built were just not designed for this kind of situation. So um, uh, now we will probably uh, ask our fellow citizens to stay at home. We will probably ask them to, uh, uh, to work at home, uh, to, uh, to, to learn, uh, to entertain, as uh, Mark uh, just uh, rightly said. And, uh, and, and, and of course, they will spend also a lot of time with their favorite broadcasters or platforms or video platforms, streaming and so on, or gamings. And then I thought, wait, maybe the networks will not be um, uh, 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 strong enough robust enough to support all this. So we tried to make some evaluation, calculation. It was right, of course. Nobody had data. Nobody had right data. Nobody, nobody could, 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 could even imagine this situation on, 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 on the continental Europe and now on the planet. No one. No one. So um, I had a very frank discussion immediately with, uh, of course, with, uh, um, with some, uh, some, uh, some CEOs. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned a few... Uh, from Netflix, uh, as things, uh, of course, uh, Disney, of course, Mark, of course, uh, Yahoo. Uh, I mean, all the, all, I mean, all the big, big, 
broadcasters, or, 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 and, and I said, you know, maybe it will be appropriate to to, to see if we can uh, to anticipate to anticipate what will happen uh, to reduce from uh, from HD to SD. And and and, and Bruno, you know, uh, I said, you know, we're in the same boat. We're on the same planet. We don't know what will happen, but we better take decisions immediately to to to, to be prepared. And I've been extremely impressed by the reaction immediately. Everyone, everyone, and, and Mark knows this very well. Everyone, he said, in less than 24 hours, yes, Commissioner, we do it. We have been the first one to uh, to ask them. And, and Europe, all at that time, the center of the pandemic. In in US, it was almost nothing at that time. Nobody. And then, of course, um, uh, uh, we start to discuss and to uh, and, and to see how together we could cope with this situation. Because again, we had to invent uh, uh, our way to, uh, um, uh, to 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 be able to uh, to react in this unprecedented situation. So the first thing here is definitely that that uh, something that uh, that uh, that I'm I'm in favor of is always when we have this kind of situation. But not only, and this is probably a lesson that we will draw for the future. Let's discuss. Let's explain our problems. At the end of the day. We represent, of course, uh, we, we, we represent our fellow citizens. We are working for them. Everyone is coming from its own constituency. Now I'm coming from the political side. I explain my problem, and we find solution together. This is really what happened, and I think this is important, including to start to think uh, uh, about the day after. But if we look, if we look at the, the next stage, we you talked about anticipation. And uh, obviously, we, we're thinking about the, the exit plans, the, the recovery plans. In, in your view, uh, what, what, should, what are you expecting from, from tech for, for, the, for the exit and the recovery phase? No, but, I mean, no, but, 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 but you know, uh, but, but Bruno, um, um, what we, usually, I mean, usually, again, we are still in the crisis, and everybody understands that. But still, uh, uh, what we could say, if we look at history, and 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 and, and this is an historical moment for uh, for us in Europe, but uh, but but everywhere else on the planet. Uh, uh, usually, usually in this kind of crisis, uh, you see an accelerator of trends. So, what are the trends today, which will drive probably uh, not only the recovery but the evolution of um, of our um, of our industry and uh, and at large of our future? First. We believe strongly in that in Europe, the Green Deal, because we believe that with uh, 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 before, of course, the crisis, it was extremely important. Everyone now is so concerned about uh, its own relation between himself and the environment and the planet and the climate. And of course, now this has been emphasized with, of course, this disease. Uh, uh, everybody understand that we are um, uh, we are a small thing. Uh, that uh, at the end of the day, uh, there is probably uh, the only border there is with the, with the virus is not between us, but uh, is between humanity and the virus. So this concern about Green Deal will be more important than ever, and I strongly believe that it will be accelerated. But the second one, of course, is digitization. And of course, we, are, we already knew that it was an extremely important uh, trend, uh, which was part, by the way, of our strategy, as you know, in Europe. And of course, now, then we had, we had uh, half of the population of our planet uh, confined, and still a lot of them are still confined, staying at home, working at home, entertaining at home, learning at home, uh, uh, socializing at home. So yes, of course, uh, um, for a lot of for a lot of our fellow citizens here in Europe, but elsewhere in the world, uh, um, believe me, uh, I, I'm I'm a strong believer that for some of them, they were not used to to, to use teleworking. And, uh, and now they know it's working. For, for a lot of them, they were not used to, to use Zoom or, or, or any kind of systems. And now it's part of our life. And we learn and on an accelerated way. So yes, it will have, I'm a strong believer on that, but it will have a very important impact on our way to work and to learn together, a very strong impact. Okay, thank you. M Mark, how, how do you see, uh, at least at this stage, Facebook's role and, and, and contribution in making yeah, well, successful the, the exit and the, the recovery plans currently being developed by, by governments all over the place? Well, 
It's a, a number of fronts, uh, like I was just talking about. I mean, there's a there's a social component of people needing to stay connected to the people they care about and work with. So, I mean, I think the the remote work and, and telework uh, theme that the commissioner was just talking about is a relevant and important one. Um, misinformation, making sure that people get access to accurate information, we 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 limit the spread of misinformation, um, is an ongoing battle. But I think in periods of high uncertainty like this, it's especially important, which is why. I specifically wanted to call out um, you know, the collaboration that we've had both with the commissioner um, and other parts of government, in, including working closely with um, with uh, Vice President Yarova and, and her office on that as well. Um, the health crisis, I think, is going to be with us for a while. So there are a number of things that we're doing there um, to work with folks to to, to basically provide insights. Um, one of the efforts there that 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 I'm particularly proud of is we've worked with a number of universities to run widespread um, surveys on Facebook asking people what kind of symptoms they're feeling. And the idea here is that, you know, right now we don't have the capacity to test everyone for the virus, but if you can ask people broadly um, and, and get a statistically accurate sample of, you know, what, what symptoms people are feeling, you can get a sense of the prevalence of those symptoms in every local region um, across the world. And that can be very valuable data to help uh, governments and local health officials uh, make decisions on how to open up and, and, and how quickly we can safely open up the economy and, and, and start uh, jump-starting and getting things back to normal there. Um, and there were a lot of challenges in, in getting that to work. Um, you know, we're working with academics, the so way Facebook doesn't um, get access to, to any people's um, direct responses about what symptoms they're having. I mean, we don't we don't want to see um, the, the raw health data, and that's there are obviously a lot of privacy concerns with that. Um, but we're helping academics do that kind of research, and that I think is ending up being very valuable as a source of data for governments uh, to make these decisions. And then, you know, I mean, looking forward, this is clearly going to be a very big um, economic recession and and long, uh, painful recovery as well. And you know, one of the big things that we focus on is is uh, helping small businesses around the world. Um, there are more than 25 million small businesses that use our services in Europe alone. Um, the vast majority of them use our services for free to have a presence online and reach people across uh, Facebook and Instagram and uh, WhatsApp and, and, and Messenger. Um, a smaller set of those advertise, and, and that's basically what makes up our, our business. Uh, but you know, small businesses are the vast majority of our business. So we're very aligned um, with making sure that small businesses can grow and thrive. And right now, they need a few things to make sure that they can survive and get through this period. One is just um, financial support. And we, we launched a, a $100 million grants program um, that's going to provide grants to more than 30,000 small businesses around the world, um, including a bunch in, uh, across Europe, uh, to try to provide financial support. Um, another piece is is just that uh, we, we're as through this period, a lot of businesses are, are relying more on internet tools, right? If you a lot of businesses that previously just had a physical storefront are coming online for the first time, and a lot of ones that had a, a digital storefront before are now finding that that's their primary way of selling stuff and reaching customers. And um, we're working on a number of different tools. Uh, to basically accelerate that. And, and, and in fact, uh, we actually have a big announcement coming up tomorrow um, where you know we, we've had some long-term commerce tools that we've been working on building. And um, I don't want to preempt my announcement tomorrow by, by saying exactly what it is now. But you know there, there are a lot of things that we've been working on for a while. And since this crisis hit, I've been meeting with our, our, our small business commerce team every single day uh, to make sure that we can accelerate that work because it's going to be, I think it could be very helpful to a lot of small businesses and um, getting through this period and thriving as they come out the other side, um, you know, doing more of their work online. So there, there, there's certainly a lot of different fronts on this, um, but, but I think more business and more life will be conducted online coming out of this. And we need to make sure that the tools that we've built um, are, are robust enough to support that and, and, and help support the economy and, and recovery. The, 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 the exit phase and, and most likely the, the beginning of the recovery phase from COVID-19 will coincide with the, the publication of new European Commission proposals on the, on the regulation of online platforms. 
Now, before addressing specific topics, I, I'd like to, to relay the first questions from, from the, the audience, um, which is addressed to, to uh, Thierry Breton. And uh, the question is the following. Platforms carry out a wide range of activities from uh, social media to app stores to facilitating travel bookings. Do you think, Commissioner, that uh, regulation should vary to take account of these uh, different activities? And if so, how? No, um, uh, you know, you, you mentioned it. We are working on the DSA. This is probably what you had in mind when you, when you said that we are working on this. And it's extremely clear that we are working on the DSA and that, of course, we, we intend to, uh, uh, to present uh, uh, our proposal uh, uh, at the end of this year. Uh, but 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 coming back to your to, to your question uh, and, and and coming back to what what Mark just said, it is uh, it, it is true that we have seen in this crisis a lot of um, uh, habits changing. Uh, uh, Mark was mentioning SMEs, and it's absolutely true. Uh, uh, um, uh, online food sales grew uh, uh, drastically during, of course, uh, the, the 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 crisis. More than more than one hundred percent in almost every single. Uh, member state uh, here uh, in Europe, so it means that people are, are, are used to it now. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, and, and 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 they have been educated. And when you start to do this, of course, you will use it. Uh, so uh, uh, it's true that we. Um, uh, I, I just want to come back of what we learned during this situation, and what I was uh, I, I was keen to um, uh, to uh, to um, uh, to uh, uh, enhance is is again that we have to invent. We have to invent together um, uh, our future. We have to do this. Uh, we did it. We have been able to, we have been able to invent a way working together uh, 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 during, uh, during this very period. And, and, uh, and, and again, it, 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 was not for, you know, it was not granted. We just invented. We were in contact, not, not every day, but at least every week uh, uh, with all the platforms. Uh, explaining the problem that we had, finding solutions together without any other concerns, but to be able just, you know what, to serve, just being able to help without any other things behind the mind. And that's for me extremely important because, of course, platforms are playing a huge role today and tomorrow. And if they want to continue to play these roles, they have to learn how to discuss with us cooperate with us. And Mark knows this very well. I told him, that, as I said to everyone, uh, we understand very well your business. We appreciate your business. But it's not us who should uh, um, adapt ourselves to you, but vice versa. This is the way it is. We are a democracy. We are representing 450 million people. And of course, we need to make sure that this will continue uh, with our um, uh, uh, our own democratic systems. And now we come regarding the platforms. Uh, um, of course, uh, we are working on ex ante regulation, you know, like in telecoms. And I think it worked pretty well in telecoms. And we will uh, we will do this again for the platforms because, of course, we understand that in some situations the platforms uh, uh, could play an extremely important, let's say, even a systemic role of gatekeepers, which is important. Mark spoke about SMEs. I'm responsible for the internal market. And of course, my job is to make sure that everyone has the same fair access to sell its product. If you are a small SME in Portugal, you must be able to sell it in Poland or in Hungary or in France. And I mean, I mean the way you will use it, the tools you will use it are important to me. I have to make sure that it is done on a fair way, uh, equitable for everyone. And there is not, not again, uh, um, uh, um, things which will, uh, which will destroy also uh, a fair access slash fair competition. So, uh, uh, you know, uh, why, why I, am, I, I am in this very situation uh, more, and, and I'm very cautious with what I will tell you now. Because again, as I, as I mentioned, we are still in the crisis. We are now, we are now to learn how to live with the virus. And by the way, uh, platforms, are, are, we have to cooperate also with this in mind. But still, uh, um, if we are talking about the day after, the exit strategy, 
uh, the world after. Uh, we learn, we learn uh, day after day uh, so far during the last two months um, how to, to work together uh, um, uh, while respecting who we are. And I think it makes me more positive that, you know, the less I will regulate, uh, the better it will be, because then I know that we'll be able to change and to adapt things which are important faster. But at the end of the day, if we cannot find a, a way, we will regulate, of course. So let's, let's take perhaps one, let's take a, a couple of, of specific issues um, where, where obviously there's a lot of interest in, in, in what both of you have to say. Uh, Mark, you talked about already uh, uh, chasing fake news uh, in, in related to, to, to COVID-19. But uh, this, and, and so that's why I'd like to, to, to that we stay one, one minute or two on content moderation of illegal and, and harmful contents. I think it's, and, and I think it's an illustration of what the commissioner just said. It, it's in the interest of all parties of good faith in the digital ecosystem to make content moderation efforts effective. Obviously, the, 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 the public interest, the public authorities' interest is self-evident. But I suppose the, the, the platform's commercial interest as well, not least because uh, such effectiveness would, would alleviate major, concern, uh, major concerns that, that brands have, that their ads may be placed in uh, the, the unwanted context of, face new, of uh, fake news, hate speech of, of violent videos or other uh, similarly unacceptable environment. So Mark, what's your assessment of, of the effectiveness of the measures which have been taken so far to, to swiftly remove illegal and, and harmful content? Sure, thanks. So I mean, before diving into that, I mean, just to echo a couple of points that uh, that 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 the commissioner just made on uh, around governance. I, I do think that when you're talking about challenges like this, whether it's um, you know, free expression and, and content moderation um, or, or kind of economic fairness, um, having a model where we can partner more closely with uh, governments to not just uh, have a sense of what is is kind of written down into the law, but um, proactively what they would like to see us be doing, um, that's very helpful. Uh, because as, as the commissioner said, I mean, that, the, the governments are the ones who are democratically elected. And, um, and, and getting that feedback and having that kind of a trusted partnership um, is, 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 is just a, a very important part of this. Um, as is on our part, um, just being increasingly proactive. I mean, these are big issues. And it's the, the big shift that we've made on the content moderation side is if you go back to when when I started the company, we used to look at content reactively. So people could post what they wanted. And if someone had an issue with something, they reported it. And then it would go into a queue and someone on our team um, would, would find, would, would basically look at it and evaluate whether it followed the rules. And increasingly, what we're just finding is that you know, we're a bigger company now. Um, artificial intelligence has advanced significantly. So, um, so we can have uh, computers and automated systems uh, look at a lot of content proactively. We can afford to hire, uh, at this point, more than 30,000 people to help do content review. So we have a responsibility to do that, I think. And what we've basically done over the last few years is we've upgraded all of our content review systems to now we, we goal ourselves, not just on um, our primary goal at this point is what percent of the content that's going to be harmful can our systems proactively identify and take down before anyone even sees it? Um, so some of that is AI, um, some of it is human systems. If a person has to see it and report it to us, um, you know, I mean, it, we're not going to catch everything ourselves, but, but, but in general, if someone has to report it to us, then that means that we uh, should be doing even better in the future. So there's, a, there's still a lot of innovation to, to happen here. Um, a, a lot of the time when, when there are bad actors there, especially sophisticated ones, um, like state actors, it really helps to have the collaboration with the intelligence community and different governments um, so we can share intelligence on, on the different threats that we're seeing so we can look into those. Those are often um, much more sophisticated and, and deeper investigations, but uh, we're, we're getting a lot better at this. I think our, our systems are, are continually um, improving. You know, just to give you one sense of this, 
Um, you know, every six months we release a transparency report on how well we're doing at proactively identifying and taking down harmful content. And um, we break it down across, uh, you know, there are about 20 categories of, of harmful content that we, that we track and are working on. You know, so everything from, um, from hate speech to uh, misinformation to um, you know, child exploitation to terrorism uh, to incitement of violence, um, all, all the different kinds of things that you'd be worried about. And each one is, is a different challenge to build an AI system or, or train lots of people um, to be able to go identify those. And we just get better and better at, at, at identifying more of the stuff proactively. I think in the last cycle, I think it was now it's more than 80% of the hate speech that we take down, our AI systems are able to identify before anyone even sees it. And that's up from um, you know, a couple of years ago, I think we were only at around 15%. So it's just the state of the, it, that, that's a lot of hard work that's going into that and improving it. Uh, but there's a lot more that we can do as well. If I have time, I'd love to add one more thing as well, which is on the governance around content moderation. Um, one of the things that, that has become increasingly clear to me is that as a private company, um, we shouldn't be making so many important decisions about what content is allowed on the internet and allowed on our services by ourselves. Uh, there needs to be some more independent governance um, around that. And in some cases, that'll be uh, national regulation. But we're also, in the countries that haven't done that, uh, we're not just waiting for governments to act. We've, we've put in place uh, this group that we, we call the Independent Oversight Board, um, which it's starting as a group of 20 people and it's gonna continue to grow. And basically it's a group that people in our community can appeal to if they think that we've made the wrong decision on whether a piece of content should stay up or, or get taken down from our services. And this oversight board will have the authority to make final and binding decisions on whether content stays up or comes down on our services. Um, so that means that even if I uh, or anyone else at Facebook disagrees with what they say, um, what they decide is the thing that's going to stick. And it's, it's meant to, you know, this board, it's not going to, uh, you know, look at hundreds of thousands of cases. It'll, it'll probably look at, you know, dozens or, or maybe over time hundreds of cases, but it's going to pick the cases that are the most important and challenging and precedent setting for the policies of, of our service and, and potentially other services on the internet. And um, I think it's a, an example of a model of independent governance that a company like ours can try to embark on and, and proactively take on. And um, we announced, I think, just in the last couple of weeks, the, the first 20 members. It's an incredibly impressive group of, of people from um, diverse backgrounds, countries around the world. Uh, one of the co-chairs is the former prime minister of, of Denmark, um, Hella Thorning Schmidt. Incredibly impressive. And one of the things that um, that uh, all of the folks involved in this have is a strong commitment to human rights and a very strong understanding of the importance of free expression to help us arbitrate these decisions. So I'll, I'll stop there, but I mean, this is a, a huge area that uh, we've just put tremendous energy into and will continue. It's, it's, um, it's obviously very important to, to get right. Thank you. It is, it is indeed a, a huge area. Uh, I think I would like to come back to the issue of governance and, and ask the the, the commissioner about that in a minute, but we have a question here to, to which perhaps you could, you could give a short answer, Mark, if, 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 if that's agreeable. Uh, somebody is asking and, us- And uh, I like, like, I like, I like to- If I could just, Commissioner, we'll, we'll talk about governance just in a second. Let me just, okay. if I may. The, Thank the, you. Because concerning the elimination of fake news and, and uh, the viewer says that uh, we acknowledge that uh, uh, Facebook has put in place uh, a number of things to eliminate fake news, uh, but some have asked for fact-checked corrections to be shared with those who've seen misinformation. What do you think about this? Is this at all feasible? Is this the right solution? Yeah, I think that there are, there are a number of cases where that, where that certainly makes sense. And around COVID, we actually started rolling out a, a new policy so that if you share something, um, or, or directly interact um, with, with something that later gets marked as false by a fact checker, we will then retroactively send you a notification um, and, and, and kind of show um, a link to a list of here's some debunked 
um, memes or, or kind of misinformation that's going around so you can uh, get the right information on that. And I think figuring out the right ways to do this at scale is, is going to be something that we're working on for a long time. I don't think that there's a single right answer. It's This is a system that will be improving over time. Um, but certainly, you know, what we try to do is focus on the efficiency of we want to identify something. Um, if, if it's problematic, we want to get to it as quickly as possible before it spreads. Um, you know, similar to to COVID or, or a virus, um, you know, that's spreading quickly. The ability to get to it quickly and identify it quickly um, limits most of the harm. So that's been the most of our efforts. But certainly, I do think the question that you're asking about. Um, you know, when when some people have seen it, how do you um, help them get access to to accurate information? Is is another important mitigation to study and, and and work on as well. And we're already starting to do that. Thank you, Commissioner. And sorry for for okay. having uh, uh, not interrupted you, but I, I, I'll give you the would like to ask you about about this issue of governance. Clearly, when we talk about uh, the the current experience uh, in the area of, uh, of of content moderation. Uh, we have the EU Code of Practice on Disinformation, which was adopted in, in 2018, which is an example of collaboration between the platforms and the Commission, uh, but which is based on self-regulatory self standards. Now, do you think that this is the kind of governance which is sufficient, adequate, maybe complemented by other forms of, of governance? Well... Um, a few things. First, on disinformation, no, I don't think it's sufficient because it is again working process, and uh, and and we have to invent it, and and we will never do enough. Let's be clear. In terms of disinformation, we will never do enough. This is a disease of the century, so uh, uh, everything which is done has to be followed. You know what, uh, Bruno? Uh, we have here in the Commission, I don't know, five or six commissioners not in charge of disinformation, but having interest on disinformation. This is the reality. It's a huge issue. And of course, I'm here discussing with you, telling you that I was able to witness a lot of progress, and especially during the crisis. And yes, we had discussions with many platforms, including Mark, and I really appreciate the efforts. Sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. But at the end of the day, what I need, what I need to, um, to, 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 to convince all my, 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 my bodies here and also the parliament is to demonstrate that we are progressing. I'm a former CEO myself. I like KPIs, including in disinformation. That's important. So of course we need to follow the progress. And if I'm not able to, to, to report with strong KPIs, we will have to regulate stronger. So that's why the cooperation, and that's why I'm op optimistic with the kind of, 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 of relations that we have established with the platforms. We all understand, they all understand, that we have been able to pass, hopefully, this situation together. Let's invent the future together. But make sure that this issue is extremely important for our democracy, extremely. So we will not be keen on here. We will be extremely attentive. Now, coming back on governance, I really appreciate, and I said this, by the way, to, uh, to Mark, I think it's a, it's a very good idea to have this oversight board. I think it's important. Uh, when, when, you, um, when you operate uh, such an uh, important platform, it's not uh, it's systemic. It is extremely important. When you are a CEO, um, uh, at the end of the day, you are the only one, the only one to be responsible. No one else. But you have an obligation. And especially in these days, where the purpose, the purpose of a company is more important than, uh, uh, than, than the status. You have an obligation, is to make your due diligence when you take a decision. And of course, when you run, I don't, and I don't want to, to give any, 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 any advice of any kind, but understand what I'm trying to tell you, is when you are the CEO of an important platform, I mean, you have to deal with a lot of stakeholders, a lot of stakeholders. So it's important, of course, that you have bodies, uh, could be advisory bodies, could be your board of director, could be any kind of things to help you to understand what these stakeholders have to tell you. Because at the end of the day, the mission of a CEO 
is to be able to listen to everyone and then to take your decision. But at the end of the day, it will be Mark who will be responsible. Nobody else. You, I, I'd like to, to move because I see that time is passing so fast and, and we have so many, so many areas still to, to tackle. Um, and I promise to, to end this by, by uh, seven o'clock uh, Brussels time. So uh, data portability, data sharing. I mean, this is a huge issue. Uh, it's, a, it's a set of issues which are drawing the attention of regulators and, and also I should say think tankers because, uh, uh, and I'm not saying that because SER is going to publish on the 15th of June a new report on the economic implications and regulatory challenge of the portability of personal data, if I may, if you pardon my, my uh, free advertising. Uh, but uh, uh, Mark, you have uh, publicly acknowledged uh, the fact that uh, if users share data with one service, they should be able to move it to another. But you have, and I think you have a point there, you have emphasized the, the balance which has to be achieved between portability and privacy. Could you please briefly develop your, your point on that? Yeah, sure. I, I think that this is a really important point. And in general, I've been very in favor of, um, of, of data portability. And I think that having the right regulation to enforce this would be very helpful. Um, in general, I don't think anyone is against the idea that you should be able to take your data from one service to another. I think all of the hard questions are in how you define what is your data, and especially in the context of, of social services, what is another person's data? So for example, no one's gonna say, okay, you uploaded photos to Facebook, you shouldn't be able to take those to another service. Of course you should be able to. And that's why we're already working on an industry consortium that we call the Data Transfer Project to enable that, um, to make it so that you can easily take photos and other content that is clearly yours and transfer it to, um, whether it's Google or, or, or smaller companies, um, however you want to make that really easy. The harder questions come um, in, in things that are not obviously your data. So for example, on the homepage of, of Facebook, um, on the website, we show uh, which of your friends' birthdays it is today. And the reason that we're able to do that is because your friends put in what their birthday is. So you didn't put that in. Um, it's not obviously your data, um, but y your friends kind of put that in and now we're using that to, to, to basically be able to tell you um, that it's their birthday. And, and of course they said that it was okay to share it with your friends. Um, so so it's, 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 um, it makes sense to show that. But now the question is from your perspective, should you be able to take um, those friends' birthdays and export that from Facebook to your calendar, right? So uh, the calendar on your iPhone or, or whatever calendar you use. And, you know, at it, it, it first blush, it seems like the answer to that should obviously be yes, right? It's, I mean, why should Facebook be the, the only service that, um, that can provide you with birthday reminders? You should be able to get those birthday reminders wherever you want. But where I think this gets hard is, you know, you didn't put those birthdays in, a friend did. So what privacy rights do your friends have over where you export that data to? Um, do, your, do your friends need to uh, now sign off and every single person agree that they're okay with you exporting that data to your calendar? Because if that needs to happen, then in practice, it's just going to be too difficult and no developer is going to bother building that integration. Um, and it's going to be, and it might be kind of annoying to request that from all of your friends. So where we draw the line on what is, um, your data and what is your your friends um, is is I think a very critical question here and you know this isn't just an abstract thing I think um, you know our platform started off more open and on the side of data portability and uh, to, to be clear that's exactly one of the reasons why we got into the issues around Cambridge Analytica that we got into because our platform used to work in the way where a person could more easily sign into an app and bring data that their friends had shared with them under the idea that if a friend had shared something with you um, for you to be able to see and use that, you should be able to use that in a different app. Um, but obviously we've seen the downsides of that, right? Which is that if you bring data that a friend has shared with you to another app and that app ends up being malicious, um, then now a lot of people's data can be used in a way that they didn't expect. So getting the nuance right on data portability, I think is extremely important. And we have to recognize that there are direct trade-offs about openness 
and, um, and, and privacy. And if our, our directive is we just want to lock everything down from a privacy perspective as much as possible, then it won't be as possible to have as open of an ecosystem as you want. And that's going to mean making compromises on innovation and competition and academic research and things like that. Um, but I also understand that you can't just go full on to the openness side because then you're compromising privacy. So getting the balance right is not something that I think any one private company um, should should basically have to make that kind of a social values or judgment call for society. I think that this is exactly the kind of thing that a regulatory framework would be very ha very helpful for um, for helping industry balance these two important values around openness and and privacy. Thanks. Be before before giving the floor to the to the commissioner, just a very very short question on on the data transfer project that you mentioned. It's a it's an initiative. Uh, which which you have uh, launched uh, with with Apple, Google, Microsoft, Twitter to to create an open source service to service data portability platform. The question is very simple: Is that initiative open to to smaller players, for instance, EU based? Um, it should be. I mean, it's it's an open project, and um, you know, I mean, we work closely with some of the larger services just to directly make sure that they're compatible. But the idea is to make it so that there's an open protocol where anyone can um, can basically take uh, photos from Facebook or, or content that's clearly theirs, and and any service should be able to integrate that, so that way um, they can transfer from from Facebook or from Google or from Apple um, to anywhere else. And it's it's a work in progress, so it may not be that everything is implemented today, but um, but that's certainly the vision of of where we're where we're going. We, we I think this is kind of the the clear, um, this, this part is clear and obviously good in terms of data portability. I think the, the parts that get a lot more challenging are some of the nuances around how you define um, what more than just your photos and, and data that you directly put in is your data that you should be able to export. And I think that those are just harder questions that we'll have to debate. Okay, thank you. Commissioner, you've announced earlier this year the, the development of a, an EU strategy for data. So, what are your plans to foster innovation through enhanced data mobility uh, fluidity? So, um, when we speak about data, um, we have to, um, to start to think of two kinds of data. First, the personal data. This is the one we are speaking about now, that, uh, that uh, with this is a very interesting comment from, from Mark about, uh, about uh, the stickiness of your, of your own data. Because at the end of the day, you know, um, uh, our fellow citizens, they just have the feeling, and more and more, and it will be uh, uh, probably um, a stronger feeling uh, uh, increasing with months and years, that the data, I mean, they belong to them. And, you know, this has been the, the GDPR. Now, uh, more and more, and especially in Europe, the feeling is that, of course, my data is part of myself. It's my life. It's me. Uh, but, of course, we are perfectly aware that on this personal aspect, um, um, uh, the access to data is the number one asset for the platform economy. And uh, uh, for what uh, uh, Jean Tirol, uh, uh, as a Nobel Prize, uh, um, uh, uh, speak about the, the dual fast, BFAS. Uh, it's important in this, uh, in, in this platform economy. But, but um, um, competition will come. Competition will come. And you will have some platforms following this portability uh, uh, probably faster than you think. So I think it's always important to anticipate uh, at the end of the day what your customers are willing to have. I remember in the good old time when I was a chairman uh, uh, of, 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 of a telco company, we had this discussion of portability. It took years and it was impossible and, then, and at the end of the day it happened. So guess what, Bruno? It will happen. It will happen and I think that like always. It's, uh, uh, and, and, and I think it was extremely interesting to, to, to listen to, Mark, uh, to what Mark said because it's not easy. It's not an easy, uh, it's not an easy, uh, an, an easy way to, to, to find an easy path. But you know, what are we doing? What are we talking about since almost one hour now together? Is how to frame this fourth dimension, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the data space. The data space is still a little bit, uh, um, uh, um, how to regulate, how to organize it. Uh, we are still uh, at the very beginning. It will take probably one generation and, 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 and it will take time. But let me tell you something that in terms of data, for the personal data, yes, uh, uh, more and more, 
the customers will understand and will, will, will request that the data belongs to them. They will ask for portability one way or the other. The second aspect is, of course, of uh, industrial data. And that's something totally different. Uh, we are at the very beginning of, of, of industrial data. This is mainly where I, where I focus, as you remember well, uh, the strategy for the EU, because it's starting now. And because, of course, um, uh, and of course, it was just before the crisis. Uh, so we are working hard to maintain, of course, our, 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 our industry uh, uh, life everywhere in the world, of course, here in, in Europe. But it's true that we are pretty advanced in terms of uh, industrial data in Europe, probably more than the US and more than China. So I know very well uh, that uh, we have to to be um, uh, to, to to work hard uh, um, uh, together to make sure that the next huge um, uh, industrial data platform player, uh, of course, uh, will be European. Because I think we have everything here, including the market, and uh, and and that's where we are working now. Uh, and of course, I could comment more, but uh, this will take another probably hour of discussion. But this is a, this is basically where we where we are focusing also our efforts. Two things again, in a nutshell, uh, of course, uh, first access to data, uh, uh, data ownership. This will be part of our, our gatekeeper regulation, and of course, the second one is industrial data. Thank you. I, I have a follow up for you uh, coming from the audience. Uh, and I read it, broadcasters complain that they have no access to the data generated by, by users consuming their content on platforms. That contributes to an unlevel playing field between traditional AVMS providers and the platforms regarding advertising regulation. At the time where broadcasters are severely hit by COVID-19, what does the Commission envisage to do to remedy that situation? Thierry Breton. No, that's a very important issue. And I had many, many discussions with broadcasters, uh, like I had again with the platforms. That's particularly important for media and broadcasters, and especially these days. So we are working on that. We are working on that because we want to maintain a level playing field here between, of course, broadcasters and, and, and platforms. That's absolutely mandatory. So we will find ways. That's something that we will have also. And again, also, with the same spirit, uh, uh, we will discuss. And, and, and we will find ways with broadcasters, and I will discuss also with platforms. And I hope that uh, with the goodwill that we are creating, we will invent here also a way uh, so that everyone uh, will be uh, good and good comfortable. So that, that's, I think, a good, uh, a good transition to my last question, which is basically the title of our debate towards a post-COVID-19 digital deal between tech and governments, with a question mark at the end. Uh, defining acceptable practices and rules for tech, which would enhance the benefits and opportunities while mitigating risk is proving to be a very, very complex exercise, which has already been occupying regulators' policymaking for a number of years. And the platforms themselves, I think that's what you you're both saying, that they're clearly part of the solution. But as we've seen with the examples of, of content moderation, data portability, self-regulation alone is for most of the issues clearly not sufficient. But on the other hand, equally, governments do not have all the tools, not need, nor all the, the instruments in their hands to fix those issues alone. So my questions to you uh, are, are straightforward. Do, do you agree with the need for a digital deal, or perhaps in less uh, flamboyant words, a mutual understanding between governments and tech? But if so, what would be the guiding principles that could be envisaged for, for what kind of, of governance? So who wants to start? Perhaps Mark, and we'll, we'll leave the last word to the commissioner. Mark, since you had started. So. Sure, sure, I'm happy to. Um, I think you're, you're right. I, I think that one of the big themes of this conversation has been the increased need for partnership. Um, th there are clearly a lot of nuances in how the platforms get developed um, that it's very hard to um, kind of get those exact nuances right in regulation. Um, but then it's also true that uh, that, that basically uh, the, the platforms shouldn't be left to govern themselves. Um, so you, you need regulation and you need cooperation and, and deeper partnership with um, with institutions that are directly accountable to the people as democratic institutions. So I think you need both. And, um, and, and having that partnership is really 
um, is, is, I think, going to be an increasingly important theme. Um, and, and one plug that I'd want to make is just from the governments that we've worked with, there really is a variance in, in, in individuals and in institutions who understand technology um, and who take the time to engage in the details of how these platforms work and craft um, more thoughtful approaches. And I do think that that's important. The commissioner was saying that um, it, it, of course, is our responsibility to make sure that we educate uh, the public and governments and institutions. But, um, but also, I, I, I just want to call out that I think that the, the partnerships that we're able to have and the engagements with different governments do vary based on how sophisticated they are and how um, much time they put into to learning about uh, about the issues and the nuances of, of how uh, the platforms operate. So I would encourage um, folks to keep on doing that. One kind of overarching theme, though, that I would say is when you're asking about whether there needs to be a, a digital, a new digital deal, and I just think it's inevitable. Um, you know, I think that there are big questions around um, balancing things like ex free expression and safety, um, privacy, uh, competition, and, and, and kind of and, and more huge, huge questions, and. I don't think that there's a question that there's going to be regulation. I think the question is um, whose framework is going to win around the world. And what, what I worry about is right now, I think that there are emerging two very different frameworks that um, are underpinned by, by very different sets of values. Um, you know, just to kind of be, be blunt about it, I think that there is a, a model that is coming out of um, countries uh, like China um, that tend to have very different values than Western countries that are more democratic. And uh, I think right now a lot of a lot of other countries are looking at um, China and, and, and their economy and the companies that are coming out of there and saying, hey, that model looks like maybe it might work. Maybe it gives um, our government more control over different things. So it might be attractive in different ways to you know force everyone to localize data and 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 make it so that um, you know, just basically, you don't have to respect human rights as like quite quite as much um, in, in in kind of how, uh, how how the society gets run, and I just think that that's really dangerous, and I, I worry about that kind of model um, spreading to to other countries, and I, I think that the best antidote to that is having a clear regulatory framework um, that comes out of um, Western democratic countries. And that can become a standard around the world that we can show works well, and that that becomes more attractive to um, countries that are kind of thinking more on the on the edge about which direction they want to go in. Because I do think that that's going to get decided in the next probably five or ten years, if I had to guess. Um, I think a lot of countries are kind of deciding which direction they they want their internet and technology policies, which are increasingly becoming more important to overall economic policies, which direction they're going to go in. So. Um, you know, one of the things that I've appreciated about the European engagement on, on these issues is that you know, when Europe sets policies, um, they, they often become the standards around the world, right? So GDPR is a good example of that. It, it, you know, technically and legally only applies in Europe. But, you know, once a company like ours goes and implements um, all, all the work that needs to be done for GDPR, it's not like we're going to then go give uh, people in other countries lesser privacy protections. Um, we've done the work to comply, so we're you know so we we might as well offer that everywhere. And I think some of the the things that are getting um, th that are basically getting thought through on these other issues, whether it's around expression and safety, misinformation, just these different areas. I, I think that there really needs to be leadership in setting up a framework. Um, and and I, I think that in a lot of places, Europe is is um, continues to to lead the way here, and, and including in a bunch of the examples that we talked about here. Um, you know, the conversation that uh, the commissioner had with with me and our team about um, preserving bandwidth in Europe during COVID. I mean, that you know, after we had that, within 24 hours, we turned around, we changed our policy. We didn't just change it in Europe; we basically changed it around the world. Um, you know, that's that's not necessarily a democratic policy, but but it's just an example of of kind of having having a framework that comes from institutions that have these more democratic values ends up being important for establishing um, kind of a better system around the world. And I, I just think we have a joint responsibility to, to help develop this. And you know, as someone leading a, a private company, I want to make sure that we engage in a way where we can help develop that. 
um, but certainly we can't develop the regulations. And, um, and that's going to need to come from governments. And I, I hope that this can, can come in, in a timely way. So that way, this kind of democratic governance becomes more of the norm and becomes more solidified across the world. I think that that is under threat now, but we can, um, but, I, but I still think we have time to solidify this. Thank you. Thank you very much. C Commissioner, uh, a new governance for the relationship between platforms and, and governments? Yes, this is really uh, uh, what I'm trying to uh, to build, and you 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 definitely understand this, and uh, and I'm glad that uh, uh, what uh, Mark said it's true that uh, uh, again um, uh, uh, he mentioned uh, what we did in Europe with GDPR, uh, what we did together when we decided, hey, we have an issue here, how how, how could we do things together, and then uh, deciding to uh, um, uh, to reduce the bandwidth in less than 24 hours because it was the interest of everyone. Uh, including, by the way, uh, its own uh, customers. So I, I, I strongly believe that, that yes, this is what we are engaging in, uh, uh, having the dialogue uh, to, to, um, to establish the, the, the right governance. But let's be clear, let's be clear. If you want to have a, um, a right uh, um, uh, setup of governance, uh, you need to have a very um, uh, uh, clear and strong uh, 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 values. And in Europe, we have these values, they are clear. And by the way, um, if you understand extremely well uh, 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 the set of our values on which we are building our continent year after year, you understand how you need to behave. And, 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 and I think that when you are running a systemic platform, it's extremely important to understand these values so that you will be able to anticipate and even better to work together with us to build year after year the new governance because we will not do this overnight we will not do this overnight we will have to build it uh, year after year but in in between uh, uh, since uh, uh, you, you, you know us i think it's extremely important to anticipate what could uh, what could create some uh, quote unquote bad reaction which will force us to regulate let's speak about taxes uh, uh, you know, I have been a CEO myself, and I always told to my team, don't try to be too smart. Pay taxes where, where you have to pay taxes. Don't go to heaven. Pay taxes. Don't be too smart with taxes. It's an important issue for, for countries where you operate. So don't be too smart. Don't be too smart. It may be something that we need to learn in the, in the, in the day to come, because we are entering into a difficult world where you will have a lot of uh, economical problems, especially for the, for, for the COVID crisis with probably a lot of unemployment. So we need to find a way together again to, uh, to, to, to jump in. That's extremely important. Uh, be careful to help the, 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 um, uh, our internal market. Don't play a role where you will be a systemic player with the gatekeeper, uh, not following others to play with. Uh, be careful uh, with the democracy. Anticipate what could have a counter effect. Be careful with this information. It could have a bad, a bad uh, um, um, impact on, on, on what is extremely important for us, including our values. And you know, at the end of the day, I think there is something that is extremely important in in, in, in our ability to work together um, uh, to, uh, to, to 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 design together the right government uh, tools and 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 and, and behavior. Um, I think we should understand that, especially for the. Um, um, uh, digital market and, and, and more than that for uh, the information society at large, uh, uh, um, because something is not prohibited, it doesn't mean that it's authorized. And I think this, is, this sentence is extremely important. It is probably at the core of the governance I would like to build with the platforms for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much. We, we, we have received many, many more questions and some very, very exciting. And, but unfortunately, uh, due to time constraints, I'm afraid we now have to, to conclude this conversation. I can tell you that, that we at SER will, will definitely continue to, to investigate the, the many complex dimensions and implications of online platforms regulation and, and to provide independent fact-based analysis and policy recommendation on how to address those. And I think this is very much in line with what you gentlemen have been discussing today and, and the way you've been discussing it, which is uh, 
basically also the purpose of our contribution of a think tank. On the one hand, to secure all citizens, users and consumers access to quality, competitive digital services that uphold their uh, democratic rights and empower them economically and socially. And on the other hand, to be conducive uh, to sustainable, innovative investment. So once again, I'd like to, to thank very, very much our, our two guests, uh, Mark Zuckerberg and uh, Commissioner Thierry Breton for, for their participation. Thanks a lot also to, to the great CER team and in particular to, to Lorian Gillet, who has organized this event. Thank you to, to the teams of, of the two speakers who have uh, helped us in, in putting this together. The video of this live will be available on CER's YouTube channel shortly. And to be kept informed about our activities, just visit ser.eu and register to our newsletter. Bye-bye. I hope to see you again soon. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.